Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, I am honored to welcome a remarkable guest, Kristen Nelson. Kristen is the CEO and founder of Audivy Memory Banks. Welcome, Kristen. And how are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me, Lance. Our pleasure. Appreciate our pleasure. Well, I, I introduced you as the founder and CEO of Auto V Memory Banks. And for our viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with Auto V Memory Banks, why don't you share with us a little bit about what it is and what trans, uh, what inspired you to create it? Yeah. I mean, like so many others who are in this work, I started this business because of a diagnosis in the family. Uh, After my father died, my mother moved to Concord, Massachusetts to live near me and my family, and shortly thereafter was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, She used to come over every day and spend every night with us, and I became really interested in the perseverative loops, the story she told again and again about her childhood. So I decided to record them, her voice telling the story with a picture, um, more for us than for her, so we would have those stories. Um, but I happened to play it back for her. And that was really the birth of Audubee. I actually have a short video clip. It's less than a minute long, but if we could show that, it shows her reaction, listening to the same memory again and again. And it kind of shows uh, the value and the, the power of her memory bank. Wonderful. Well, let's play that video now. And Miss Margaret stood at the pillar and you took your roommate's hand yes. and you went just up to the door and then you went down like that. Can you imagine? Like it, and then you went down like that. Unbelievable. Can you imagine? Like a curse. Oh, well, there were many things to do. And you took your roommate's hand and you went just up to the door and then you went down like that. Can you imagine? Like a curse. Oh, well, there were many things And then you went to your table. Unbelievable. What do you, what goes through your mind or your emotions when you look back and watch that? Yeah, I mean, when I saw her, it occurred to me like, wow, the memory. She has such profound short-term memory loss, but those long-term memories clearly provide her so much happiness. You know, she finishes the sentences, she's laughing, she's acting out that story. And because of the short-term memory loss, she could watch it every day and get the same enjoyment. She's always like, when did you do this? I've never seen this before. Like it was so powerful. And I, it actually, I had this epiphany of, you know, we lose our hearing, we get a hearing aid, we lose our eyesight, we get glasses, we lose our memory. We have no comparable sort of prosthesis to help people support them through the loss. And as I watched my mom, I thought, wow, I mean, that's what your memories can do is really provide a lot of comfort and and guidance through the decline. That's wonderful. Kristen, let's uh, walk me through exactly how the app works and, you know, how how many memories can be put into this memory bank? Is there a limit or is it kind of like our hard drives in a way where you have so much storage and then you have to either expand or delete old ones? Walk us through the process. Yeah. So the app is, I mean, I'm super proud of the developers who've done this. It's a really simple app to use. Um, It's essentially three steps to get started. You download the app, you create a personal memory bank. So, you know, there's a Kristen Nelson memory bank that holds all of my memories with my voice telling my stories. Um, Second, you name it. So, you know, I've named it Kristen Nelson. And the third is you decide your privacy settings. Do you want it to be public where anybody who has the app can see it, which actually can be really beautiful and fun to see all these old memories, or you can make it private where no one else can see it. Or you can make it private and share it just with people, friends, families, others that you want to be able to have access to it. Um, So that's the initial creation of a memory bank. And then after that, you just start adding memories. Every memory includes both a photo and audio file. Now, again, this was sort of based on watching my mom, listening to like the voice, the stories, sort of taking you on that trip down memory lane. 
and having like engaging the visual cortex, getting both sensory uh, and emotions involved. Um, and you can just keep going. You ask a question, record the answer. Maybe there are favorite stories that somebody tells you. Record that story. You upload a photo. Each one, record, upload a photo. Uh, and it is um, unlimited. So you can save an unlimited num number of memories in each memory bank. That's wonderful. Have you uh, have you continued using the memory bank for yourself? Uh, so my mother has passed away. Um, but I have to say it's, you know, now it's this gift to all of us, the family, we have, you know, all of these memories, these photos centrally stored where we can all access them and continue to hear her and her voice tell her stories. I'll tell you, there's interesting research about the power of voice uh, and how hearing the voice of a loved one actually produces the same physiological response as being hugged by them. Wow. Your love hormone goes up, your stress hormone goes down and and you're just taken back to them. So it's sort of now this beautiful gift of, of having this closeness to her even after she's passed. That's tremendous. So walk us through, because I'm sure viewers and listeners who may not be familiar with uh, Audivy, and they're wondering, you know, how do they get started? You know, we're going to have the website up here on the screen as well as in the show notes. But, you know, how do they get started? Who creates this memory bank? Is it the individual with memory loss, the family, the caregiver? Maybe it's a little bit of both or all of the above. Yeah. I mean, of course, my my dream would be that people start creating them later in life, but early before you have sort of profound short-term memory loss, right? What if it was when you first receive a diagnosis or start noticing that your memory is compromised, start saving some memories, you know, put them away. Like, you know, we, we store lots of um, other things in case we need them later. Um, I always note that, you know, we don't lose our memory in some catastrophic event. It usually does take time and there are warnings and symptoms. So what if we took advantage of that time to create a memory bank that might be helpful later? But assuming that people haven't done it early on, then it really becomes the responsibility of a caregiver or a family member to help create the memory bank um, and sit with a person and ask the questions, upload the pictures, record the responses. Um, my other dream is to really make this an intergenerational product because what a wonderful thing for the grandkids to come and do with a grandparent or a, an aging parent. They have the technological know-how. They, you know, are not that it's that complicated, but, you know, they're savvy enough to like click through the app. Um, and then they also get that, that moment of connection. I mean, so many people have said to me that they understand I'm really focused on the value of the memory bank for individuals with dementia, right? It's this super powerful transportative trip down memory lane. But people have said, don't forget the beauty of that moment of creating the memory bank. When you bring together a grandchild, listening to a grandparent and asking the question. So um, we have examples where grandkids were trying to engage more grandkids in doing this. Um, alternatively, it can be when a you know, a caregiver or a caregiver organization comes into the home, it can be a really helpful tool to have in the home. So a caregiver can help do this. Even a professional caregiver can help do this for the individual and then make it available for other caregivers on their team. That's wonderful. And I'm, I'm going to ask this and I'm going to assume, which I shouldn't, is there a legacy um, firewall built in? So let's say your loved one passes and do they bequeath that memory bank to a designated person in the family or how does that work? So, um, you know, in all of our cases, it has not been created by the senior. The owner has tended to be the younger generation. Okay. Um, but that being said, there is a way to transfer ownership. So a memory bank does get created and owned by one person. And like I said, you can then invite other people to contribute to it and share it with them, um, but they are not an owner, but they can help add memories. So if you wanted to change the owner, you could do that um, by emailing Audubee. Oh, wonderful. And I'm assuming, you know, the answer to this is really it can be used anywhere, but, you know, can Audubee memory banks be used in only a community setting or can it be used in the home? Where What's the ideal environment for its use? Yeah, so um, I think we're still sort of trying to test the waters on all of those options. Um, 
we have started to work with a couple communities where they're giving it as a welcome gift. So awesome. somebody's moving into the community and they uh, give it to the child again, not to the senior, but to the family. And they say, you know, we're welcoming your mom into our community. Please, before she moves, start a memory bank, like do it before she comes here. And then it can help actually through that transition, which Great can enough. often be so difficult. Um so then it can be used in the community setting. They can keep to adding to it because if the family makes the community a contributor, uh, the community can now access it. And when they have reminiscent sessions, they could record the information and continue, continue to add to it. Um, they could have reminiscence activities. I've worked in one community where it's being introduced through the spiritual department for sort of an end of life review. They see the value for people to sit and reminisce as a group and hear about each other and learn. And, I'm, you know, if you save them in a memory bank, then the person gets to enjoy them and then pass it down to their family. So that's been a lot of my focus is on the community setting. It seems so sort of easy and a nice way of bringing cohesiveness to the community. Um Actually, I'll add two other things. One is that in one community, they were saying these are fantastic for their overnight caregivers to get to know the residents because okay. they often don't really know them that well and often have to interact with them. But if they've listened to the memory bank, all of a sudden you have these like wonderful stories of who they really are and how they played the piano or used to do horseback riding when they were growing up. Uh, so that's another use of it in the community. Um, uh um, but others have said it's so powerful in the home because the home is actually a much more difficult environment for individuals with dementia. A caregiver is really one-on-one -on -one and it is harder to find activities to do. Um, and so having that as a tool is probably more impactful in a home where there are fewer options. Okay. Now I'm going to ask this question and I'm gonna preface this with a short story about myself. You know, um, ever since my children were born, every aspect and moment of their life has been documented in video, photo. And in fact, it got to such a degree that I had to purchase recently a large external uh, hard drive, and we're talking 40 terabytes. So anybody that knows hard drive space knows 40 terabytes is quite significant. And for me, I like it. And I think the kids, you know, there's moments they enjoy looking back, you know, at their second birthday or, you know, their first Christmas, things like that. But for me as the parent, I like being able to go back. And sometimes I, I hesitate to do so because it's a little depressing at times too, to see how quickly, you know, time passes by all of us. How How is this different than just making a video or an audio recording on someone's phone? Yeah. Um so first of all, um, I'll speak to the reminiscing, like, yes, we all like to reminisce. It is a beautiful thing to sort of remember those times when our kids were little. So that sort of is also at the heart of all of it. It's like, yeah. it's a wonderful exercise to reminisce. Um, so first I'll say the difference is um, we do not have video uploads in Audi. It is all audio plus visual. And again, that's really optimizing the product for individuals with dementia. Um, my mother, for example, and I'm sure it'll be familiar to other listeners, she couldn't read a book anymore. It's, you know, there's not enough going on. It's hard to follow. She couldn't watch a movie. There's too much going on. Um, but we believe that that audio visual combination is the Goldilocks sweet spot for engaging and maintaining engagement for an individual with dementia. Sure. Um, so Philosophically, we believe that audiovisual is better than video, but there's also a certain amount of dissonance involved in a video. So, for example, if you were to videotape an 80 year old talking about her wedding 60 years ago, it's essentially a viewing experience of an 80 year old telling a story about when she was young. And, you know, you sort of look at it and you're like, oh, I remember that room or that dress or where she's sitting or, yeah, look at her. I remember grandma at that time. But contrast that with watching a picture of her on her wedding day mm. and listening to her voice talk about that day. We were in Indiana. We had sandwiches out at my mom's house. You're, the, you're taken there. Right. It's not like just watching an 80-year-old talk about that. So the videos, videos can be beautiful. And I uh, agree. I love the videos of my kids. But for an individual with dementia, 
I think that that audio visual aspect is what's really powerful to keep them engaged and um, really transported um, through the reminiscence. But secondly, um, folks have said, well, so why don't I just record some stories on my phone? Um, now, again, you miss the audio visual combination, which I don't think audio is really su sufficient to sustain a person's interest. But in addition, Audivy's, um app lets you, as I said, share with family members. So back to my example of, you know, if my uncle is moving somewhere, I can create a memory bank for him and I can share it with my cousins. They have to download the app, but I can share it with my cousins, um, keeping it private, but then they can see it. So when they go visit their father, they can access all the work that I've done. It's not just on my phone. I don't have like my own audio recordings that, of my uncle. I've put it on a centralized platform where anybody can see it and anybody can contribute to it. Now, even better, say the uncle goes traveling to California and does start experiencing, you know, distress or anxiety or confusion, pull up the memory bank. Like anybody can use it wherever you are. I was saying there was another um, community that's starting to uh, integrate Audivy into their setting. And they were like, this is going to be in our go bag. So when somebody ends up in the emergency room, we can play their memory bank, give them that comforting, calming tool, and you have it wherever you are. So um, I think that centralized um, availability is one of the most important aspects. That's wonderful. You know, and that just kind of brings me to a follow-up question, Kristen. For families who maybe have you know, these treasure trove of photos and, you know, maybe some audio recordings, but most likely just, you know, photos or video. Can they upload existing photos into Audivy? Yeah. Um, so it's not intended to function as a photo album. Okay. But as I say, every memory does include a photo plus the audio. And you can either, you know, take a picture of a photo. So in the app, Again, I do have a short clip that we could um, share, which shows how the app sort of it walks through the steps of the app. Um, and maybe we could show that later. But it does let you just upload a picture um, or take a picture of a picture. I always say, like, these don't have to be the best pictures. You just want something that is representative and connects a little bit to the story to engage the visual cortex on that trip down memory lane. Um I think it's, as you say, families have, we have so many pictures of my parents and grandparents and great grandparents, and they're completely wasted in these boxes and drawers, and they get moved from one house to the next when somebody passes. So ought to be a way to bring them to life, put them in there, just say, what's going on? Who's in this? Like what year, what town, who are they? Um, I think that we feel lucky when we find an audio that has some little scribble of the date but Audivy provides an opportunity to really give more of like information about what's going on in those beautiful photos. Are you utilizing uh, metadata in these photos? Um, so there's no identifying information. I mean, people just upload their own photo. Sure. But I mean, I guess like if you tagged in the photo is, you know, grandma wedding 1932, you see the picture and grandma's saying, you know, that was me and grandpa and his brother, Bill, you know, is there a way to tag that to other pictures of grandpa and uncle bill or are they standalone? No, they're standalone. I mean, that's definitely part of the auto V maybe 5.0 when we get to 5.0. Yeah. Um, so totally, yeah. totally agree. You could just have that. So the other thing I'll say is that when you upload stories, um, you do put them into chapters. You can come up with your own chapter names. We offer a handful of um, example chapter names like growing up, my parents, my grandparents, um, to, you know, give people an idea of how to do chapters, uh, but people can do their own. And I do think over time, we would love to be able to tag the photos so that chapters could form um, uh, automatically. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, you're speaking from also professional experience. You're uh, certified as a dementia care practitioner UCLA memory trainer, and you're also an advisor at the University of Vermont's Women in Leadership Program at the Grossman School of Business. So you know what you're talking about and the many benefits of, you know, memory and, you know, just having that cognitive stimulation and that audio stimulation. Um, do you ever get questions about, you know, concerns, especially in this day and age about, you know, protecting privacy of users? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of concern about privacy. So what we have done at this point is we essentially, we don't gather information. We don't care. We're not trying to, you know, mine the data for information about people. When you sign up and get an account, you put in your email address. That's it. There's no more identifying information. You will name a memory bank. Um, some people say like mom's father, like you, we don't even verify who it is. You come up with the memory bank name. I mean, in in my case, I gave them my parents' real name, but uh, we don't have any other identifying information. And I mentioned earlier that you can share the memory bank with other people. Um, you have to know the email address of that individual to be able to share it. We don't have like autofill information for, you can't go fishing around for like who else is in Audubee. There's no way of finding other users or information about them. And, uh, you know, in the way it's encrypted, I can't, somebody said to me once like, well, can you just move, you know, I did these memories. Can you move them to a different bank? I'm like, no, there's no, it's completely encrypted in the, in the database. So there's no way of finding anything out or sharing. What do you suggest to people who are listening or watching this and, you know, this would be great for grandma or this might be great for themselves and, but they say, well, I don't have any photos. How do you, how do you rectify that? Yeah. I mean, so like I said, we do think it's important that every memory engages um, the visual cortex just as a way of holding attention. So Audivy automatically inserts an abstract image with every memory. So as you listen, there's automatically an abstract image. You can change the photo at any time. Um, in some cases, you know, if if um, one person was telling the story of going to like Malden High School and they don't have any picture of Malden High School, but their son like downloaded a picture of Malden High School that's on the internet in black and white. So now there's a picture of her school. It wasn't part of her collection. So in some ways you can upload pictures that match the storyline, even if they're not specifically from your archive. And then otherwise they will have an abstract image, again, just to engage the visual cortex. That's wonderful. How about gifts? Does Audivy make a good gift? And if somebody wants to send a gift for the holiday season or just because, or for a birthday, what's the best way for them to do so? So um, because it's an app, people can always gift an app. It's probably not that well known. You have to just go to the Apple store. Um, and when you click on the app, you do the little upload button. And then one of the options is gift the app. And then you just enter a person's email address. Um, the app is currently $19.99. It's a current um, one charge, no ongoing fees. Uh, to be able to save unlimited memory. So you're essentially giving them, an email will go to them with that, um, the app as a gift. And then you also have the option on our website to ask that a gift be sent. And by that, it's basically the information about how to use it. Um, what are the questions we have? A bunch of questions in Audubee's app. Um, and so it's information about the questions that are in there to give them an idea of how it's used and the instructions for that, along with a card just explaining the gift. Um, so, And, you know, for people that may have a little fear or phobia of new technology or technology in general, and but yet they want to take advantage of this great resource, what kind of support or what kind of help is available to them? Yeah, so we are just starting um, at the beginning of December a twice weekly online webinar um, where people can join, they can ask questions, they can just listen. We'll go through how do you use the app? Um, how do you share the app? How do you not only create the memory bank, but also use it with the individual? Um, so, you know, I think like I've said, I mean, to me, the the power of this is really as a tool for dementia care. I mean, it certainly has a legacy product to it. But for anybody who um, has a person, knows a person with dementia, um, depending on their cognitive decline, reminiscing and talking about the olden days is often a really wonderful place to be. Um, and so in that webinar, we will also talk about just doing that with the person, enjoying the stories about like, what was your first car? And what about when you lived out in Berkeley? And, you know, sort of engaging a person on those stories. And while you do it, 
saving it with Audubee. Yeah. So that the next time you don't have to be there asking those questions again. Now you can just play it for the individual. Um, so we'll go through both how to reminisce with a person, how to save it with Audubee, how to engage that product, how the tool later on. Um, I actually, I visited one client, um, an older couple. He has pretty severe dementia. And as I entered, he was in a repetitive loop about his childhood. And the wife looked at me like, do you see what I have to deal with? You know, he's driving me crazy. Uh, but I went over and I put on his memory bank. And all of a sudden, he's just engaged with his memories. She was like, then she went off into the kitchen. She's making her lunch. He didn't need her as the receiver of those stories. He was happy, engaged in them himself. So again, we want to teach people how to be able to use that as a tool for the caregivers and the family members. That's wonderful. You know, I want to I want to just kind of harken back. You said Auto V 5.0. And I always like to ask guests, if we didn't talk and hopefully we'll keep in touch and, you know, we'll have you back on again in the future, but we didn't talk to each other for the next five years and we ran into each other grabbing coffee or breakfast. Where's Audivy five years from now? What's your goal or what's your hope? I mean, so I think I really do hope that it becomes part of the standard of dementia care that Next month, I'm actually going to Penn Memory Center, and I'm going to be talking to them about um, using it with their, well, uh, talking to the caregiver families about using it and integrate it into the clinic's offerings. So, you know, as people go into the Boston Memory Center and are like receiving a diagnosis, what do we do? Create a memory bank. Like, yeah. That's an easy one. So my hope would it be like really embedded in care um, and something that both is of value to the individual, as you saw with my mom, enjoying her memories again and again, uh, but also really helpful for the caregivers. You know, I sort of mentioned it earlier with that couple and how it was so frustrating for the woman. The memory bank becomes just this playground that the caregiver can give to an individual if they're in the emergency room, if they're experiencing anxiety, irritation, whatever it is, it is a really, um, I, I know I, I overuse the word transportative, but it is transportative. It's, it's just their memories, their voice. It takes them out of that negative place into a happy space. Um, so I hope that that really becomes embedded in it. Again, great research on an individual with um, Alzheimer's you know, can't make short-term memories. So won't remember what, hap what just happened, what was just said, but their emotional, the amygdala doesn't decline as quickly. So their emotions will um, last longer. Yeah. So the research that was done, and maybe you've heard about this, but, you know, a bunch of people went to a movie. It was a, you know, a stress provoking movie and some of them had dementia, some didn't. Afterwards, they did a test and everybody was like feeling stressed from the movie as would be expected. But later that day, they tested everybody again. And those that had dementia still were feeling stressed. They couldn't articulate why they didn't, they weren't, it wasn't like, well, that movie earlier today really has kept me on edge, but they still had those elevated levels of stress. Those who didn't presumably had gone about their day. They just registered happiness or whatever it was that they'd been doing and had moved on. So Back to the memory bank. If we can show the memory bank and reignite those happy days of their youth, you've you've now reset that emotional stage for them. If they're prone to sundowning, you do it at five o'clock. Now you've sort of primed them for a happy afternoon and evening. And it's that would be my goal. That's wonderful. Um, what is is it a subscription? Is it a one time cost? How does that how does the financing work for it? So it's currently a one-time cost of $19.99. I um, well worth it. I yeah, it's not a lot. Um, I I I really believe you you know this about me. I have a background in public health and I, I Oh, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there, Kristen. I'm not gonna <laughs> let you leave without talking about it. I really believe in the sort of the public good of our shared memories, of our individual memories, of the sanctity of like, we should hold those and make those available and accessible for everybody, regardless of income, regardless of need, but especially for those who need them most, i.e. those who are losing their memories. So my focus has been on trying to make a price point that's accessible, 1999 
I know apps are supposed to be free and it's not free, but it can't be free. <laughs> not all apps. I mean, usually the apps that are free, there's usually, you know, add on purchases once you get the app. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. We talked to a lot of app developers in the senior care, caregiving dementia space. And, you know, the app stores, people don't realize this. You're, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, you're not getting that 1995 or 1999. A lot of that goes to Apple or Google for hosting your product on their store. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, that is what it currently is. Um, I really hope that it can stay at that price point um, because I would like to make this a product that is not, you know, reserved for some group that has more access to resources. Um, before I get to my last question, I want to ask you this. Do you have, being a developer, you know, and just putting your heart and your soul into this product, which I, I recommend everybody go download this. It's going to be so beneficial, not only to your loved ones, but also to yourself. You know, you're going to have those memories forever, but you're also giving good, positive, you know, engagement and stimulation to your loved ones using it. Is there one piece of, you know, feedback or letter, email or comment that you've received since you developed this? And I know it's not an easy process to go from conception to, you know, releasing it to the public that has just really stuck with you and said, you know what, we're on the right path and this is going to be something that's going to benefit people. I know you probably get several, but is there one that really stands out? Mm. Um, there. I mean, just yesterday, I spoke to a professor at University of Texas. This isn't, I mean, it's just, she was so impressed with, because she's done reminiscence work and trying to record it. Um, and Affirmation. Uh, what's that? So you're getting that affirmation from the professional community. Well, and she's just like, wow, this app, the simplicity, the elegance, the like the validity, the thoughtfulness. It's like, it's so simple and so easy to use. But the the really powerful comment was from a woman who is in the dementia. She's actually more in the dementia financing space and more of pharmaceutical products, not like I think of this as a non-pharmaceutical intervention for dementia care. Uh, she said, it reminds me of the iPhone. We never knew how much we needed it. And now we can't imagine life without it. Mm. She was like, memory banks. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing? Like, how do we have people losing their memories that we're not just like tucking them away in a memory bank over the, that long course of decline? We get a lot of time when we could put, be putting this together. It's it's not this like, oh my gosh, I should have done something. Right. That time we've got resources around us. We've got people, grandkids, nieces, nephews. We can engage in sort of creating that social fabric together and then making it this amazing tool going forward. Because it's one thing, the other thing I'd say with my mom, uh, she, you know, okay, reminiscing is really therapeutic, you know, reduces depression, improves mood, all of those things. You save it in memory bank and you have like access to that 24 seven. You can just like play your memories, play your memories. But even more importantly, even as you continue to experience cognitive decline, you can still enjoy reminiscing. My mother couldn't, like, she couldn't articulate those memories anymore, but she could still enjoy them because they were all saved in her memory bank. So it gives that longevity, which, I mean, the power of that is so obvious that, you know, I just hope people will take the time and make the leap. We we fully support you. We support Audivy and the memory banks. You know, we, we get inundated with requests from app developers and software and all the newest, latest tech and gadgets. And we're, we're very, very critical and selective on who we have on the show because, you know, our reputation and our integrity, you know, our viewers and listeners uh, trust that. And we never want to violate that trust because it, it's very sacred to us. And we fully support and believe in the work you're doing, Kristen. Um, we had a wonderful conversation not too long ago. Um, I just have to bring it up. One of my heroes and idols uh, in college was Dr. Paul Farmer. And unbeknownst to me, you worked for him for 20 years. And one of the books I do want to plug here is Mountain Be uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, A Man Who Could Cure the World. Um, just an incredible book. Um, I want you to share what what's your greatest memory of Dr. Farmer and the 20 oh. years you spent with him? And I know that's a hard question. You can give me more than one. Well, because as you know, and he's just, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Um, uh, yeah. So I started there when uh, there were 
basically three of us. It was a, the early days of the organization. So it was a lot of fun. We worked round the clock. He is an unbelievably passionate and compassionate and funny and hardworking, but the work was fun. We enjoyed doing it. It was really hard. That was okay. Um, and he had extraordinary vision. I mean, you know, you hear people say like, oh, you really got to think outside the box. Paul really thought outside the box. Like he really managed to push us in ways that we didn't even know. Well, and and from the outside perspective and just my research and reading about him and following him, is it fair to say he was kind of like our modern day Mother Teresa where, you know, she went into Calcutta when that was totally taboo and you just don't go into leper colonies. He's going into Haiti and all these places fighting tuberculosis. And it was unheard of at the time. This was before Doctors Without Borders. Well, and it was at a time when people were like, yeah, HIV. Yeah. yeah. I mean, AIDS is really like going to destroy Africa. And he was like, well, no. That's not okay. Like, right. we can't just let that be. So he would always say, let's go. You know, when we started our work in Rwanda, he said, take us to like the most godforsaken part of Rwanda. That is where we want to put our stake in the ground. We want to make sure that the poorest of the poor, the most isolated in remote areas, have the same unbelievable access that we benefit from here in Boston. And you should see the hospital in Rwanda now and in Haiti. I mean, really extraordinary facilities with dedicated staff, the Rwandan staff, the Haitian staff, building out, giving them the resources that they want and deserve as much as we. Didn't he also establish uh, the first medical school somewhere? Uh, the Global Health Equity um, Program in Rwanda. Well, in it, uh, in Haiti. I mean, in both places, he has really built out incredible programs, training programs. That's incredible. Well, yeah. Kristen, I, I just appreciate knowing you, and I'll thank you for both your work with Partners in Health and for Audivy, Um, and hopefully we'll have you back on again in the future. Thank you so much. I do hope Paul will... And all the partners in health will will think of this as and as somehow an extension of the work. Whereas I say I really feel like I'm trying to continue to ensure memories for those who are losing memories. Yeah. You know, we we want to make sure that people who need the resources are given them. So I, I look at this as an extension of that. All right. Well, we're going to have links to Audivy up on the screen as well as in the show notes. And you know, thank you for sharing your photos and uh, videos with us as well. Great. Thank you so much, Lance. I really appreciate the opportunity. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com, where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions. Every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our official YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you'll never miss an episode. We'd also like to say thank you again to Kristen Nelson for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.